This brings us into their figure one, uh, where they show that transient pyromycin enriches for HDR efficiency. So in figure one A, what you can see right here, um, we'll focus more on the left right here. So you have the, your your guide RNA, and what they did is they designed a guide RNA that focuses on um, their chosen disease relevant site. So they they chose the best one mutation site. Now, uh, what you have right here as well is just a, a usage promoter that drives the, G the expression of this sgRNA. Um, on this other side, you have um, the Cas9 protein. So you have your promoter, you have your Cas9 protein, and then you also have your PAC, so the, um, the pyromycin-resistant gene. So when you combine these two, um, if the cell would have both of these, then the if the cell has both of these uh, combined together, um, then the cell would be able to survive, theoretically, the pyromycin antibiotic. Now, 1B is their workflow. So it's about a 12-day process. Um, before they even start, they, they would seed the cells with rock inhibitor. Rock inhibitor is just a chemical or a solution that helps um, single cells survive. Um, so then on day zero, what you would do is you would uh, insert your CRISPR plasmid with your um, SSODN, so your desired uh, insertion sequence. And the way that they do that is through electroporation. So this was also in uh, the lecture slides. So what essentially you have is you have your plasma membrane. This is the just like the visual of the outside of a cell um, and DNA on the outside. So this is what you want to insert. So DNA can't naturally just like uh, be pushed through to the center of the cell. What they do in electroporation is uh, they add an electrical pulse. And what this electrical pulse does is that it kind of separates the plasma membrane temporarily such that the DNA, your desired SSODN, is able to insert into the, the cell. Now the only downside of this is that sometimes you can have a lot of cell death um, so it's very, I would say it's, it's kind of rare that like you have your DNA actually like successfully placed into the cell. Now what they found in 1C is actually very interesting. So they had both a positive control right here and then a negative control right here. If you look at the negative control, um, day one, you have cells, um, the positive control also has cells as well. Um, and then day four for both you see a lot of rounded cells except um, you could see like a small colony growing right here and then by day 12 there's basically no no cell growth in the negative control and then you have cell growth in uh, the experimental group where you had your sgRNA your plasmid and your uh, SSODN um, it says in the paper that they uh, depending on the concentration of the pyromycin, so it was like 0.5 micrograms per milliliter and 0.3 micrograms per milliliter, um, there's about 25% homology directory repair. So um, it's pretty cool that to see like the pyromycin um, insertion into the cell actually works and is able to make that cell resistant to pyromycin antibiotic. So next we go into figure two. Now I know that this is a lot on the page. So what we're gonna do, we'll, we'll split up uh, figure two into two different parts. So we'll just focus on the left part right now. Now the goal of this figure is to demonstrate um, the pyromycin treatment's ability to correct a mutation. Um, if you look at the top, so figure two A, on the cell line that we're using is the BD6-4. And the mutation, the specific mutation that um, these cells are going to have is R218C, which is for that the best one, so the um, retinal dystrophy thing. Um, you also are we are also are using a guide RNA that focuses on that mutation, and then an SSODN that will try to repair that back to its wild type wild type state, and it just gives the culture condition. So with iPSC cells. It's very common to use NT01 as your media and then Mage Drill as your cell coding. Um, they further go into um, just the, the DNA sequence of the actual mutation. So if you look right here, the TGT, this is where the 
R218C mutation is. The wild type is normally CGT. And what they're going to try to do is just use an SSODN to fix that mutation back to its wild type state. Now in figure C, what we'll see here is the, the pyramycin treatment. Um, on the y-axis of this one, you have the number of clones per well. On the x-axis, you have the pyramycin concentration in micrograms per milliliter. So they had basically um, no concentration of pyramycin all upwards to 0.4. Um, and as, as you can see, it's kind of expected, I guess, um, is that as you increase pyramycin concentration, the number of clones that you get that survive uh, decrease. Now, what they did with these clones is that they wanted to connect um, pyramycin concentration with the percentage of module directed repair that they get versus the amount of indels that they get or the insertion deletions. Um, we could just focus on the higher concentration, so 0.3 micrograms per milliliter and 0.4 micrograms per milliliter. What they found is that out of the clones that they got, um, over 20% expressed reads, which is which is very cool because um, uh, it's it's cool to see that the as you increase pyramycin concentration, you'll get definitely less clones, but you can get uh, more HGR percentage. Now, what they want to do with that too is they want to compare this method of pyramycin treatment to re the reporter transfection with that Cas9 protein in the GFP. So what they did is they, um, instead of the, the pack resistant gene, they added that GFP and they, they did the same thing. So in figure 2D, you have the number of clones per well um, on that Y axis and then GFP sorting bin. So they sorted it with no fluorescence, low GFP fluorescence, medium fluorescence, and then high fluorescence. And what immediately you can see is that these two graphs have very, very different amount of clones. So the GFP, um, when you soar into the bins, I guess the, the cells have a really, really high chance of dying, which they did. Um, yeah. So next they basically repeated the same thing, um, except they used a different cell line and a different mutation. Um, so the cell line that they're using this time is BD4-18. And the mutation that they're going to try to fix is the N296H. This still correlates to the best one mutation. Uh, your sgRNA changed too, so now the, your sgRNA is going to focus on that N296H mutation, and then your SSODN is going to try to repair that mutation back to the wild type form. So similarly to before, you have your muta mutated genome sequence, you have your wild type genome sequence, and then you have your SSODN, which is trying to convert this uh, this mutation back to its wild type state. Um, there's a lot of similarities to um, the first part of figure figure two. You have at lower concentrations a lot of clones that are generated, and then the higher you go, um, of course, the less clones that you'll get. But if you look down here, you get more HGR shown in green, and then. It's pretty drastic over here. So you have for the GFP sorting bin, you have a number of clones right here. You barely have any clones that survived the sorting. Um, and then there is minimal data on uh, the HGR versus indel percentage. Yeah, so just to recap, this figure two was just trying to demonstrate how pyramycin treatment fares against um, the GFP um, method that uh, was used before. Now what they did in figure three is that they just kind of summarized their findings from figure two and then what they found was that increasing pyramycin concentration increased percent of overall editing. So what you'll see on the y-axis is percent of overall editing, not homologous and joining in HDR. And then you have your pyramycin treatment just in uh, abstract, abstract term, so no pyramycin, low pyramycin, medium, and high. And what you can see is that in the no pyramycin, you basically get uh, no overall editing. Um, as you increase to medium and high pyramycin concentrations, 
you get a larger amount of HDR editing that is occurring. All right, now it brings us to figure four. And what they did is they took the information that they got from figure two, which talked about um, how many clones survived, what percent of HDR there was, and what percent of indels there were. And what they did was they took the optimal condition, so they took high pyromycin concentrations, and they applied it to this, where they tried to correct a mutation. So specifically, we're using the BD6-4 cell line. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to correct the best one uh, R218 mutation. Um, what this is, is a the mutation is a TGT, and what they're trying to convert it back to is its wild type form, which is a CGT. Um, what they show right here is just the sequence that includes the PAMP sequence and then your target sequence. Um, this is the mutation that they're just trying to change. Now, what they generated from this experiment is 16 clonal lines, and what they did was they uh, Sanger sequenced it, and what the Sanger sequencing does is that it creates these chromatograms um, seen right here, and what these chromatograms do is it uh, it provides a sequence of a certain portion of your um, DNA. So what happens is you have your cells, you isolate your DNA, um, you run a PCR on that, and then you send it in for sequencing, and this is the results that you would get. So there's one, two, three, four different results that um, were, were created. Um, so for example, we'll look at the corrected um, out of the 16 population, seven of them successfully corrected the mutation. So you have CGT and CGT. So if you look down here, if you look at the Singer sequencing analysis, um, there's a C and a G and a T. Now, there are different types of reads that you get for a chromatogram. Um, these are actually pretty clean. So what can determine a clean peak from a, diff uh, from a, a messy peak is that if you look right here, there are... Oh, Oops. There's no overlap of the peaks, right? So then this can clearly see that this is, uh, tell the machine that it's a C. Uh, for this one, um, you can clearly see that it's a G. This one, you can clearly see it's a, a T. But if you look at um, one of the other clones that created an indel, for example, uh, you have ends instead of a nucleotide, just because right here you have overlapping peaks so it's very difficult to differentiate, oh, okay, this one is an A, this one's a T. Um, it's basically impossible for this one. Um, it also created non-clonal lines, two of them. And then uh, a good amount of unedited CGT, TGT clonal lines. Now, a good thing to always do as well is to also verify, okay, so we have these edited cells. Are these cells karyotypically normal? So what they did is they, they just sent it in for karyotyping. Um, they found that it is karyotypically, karyotypically normal. You have two, micro, two chromosomes per pair. Um, normally, like if you had a mutation of a chromosome, you could have maybe have on chromosome pair number 18, you could have like three chromosomes. That'd be, that'd be irregular. Um, and then in 1D, um, what they did is they uh, created like a TACMAN scorecard. It's called a TACMAN scorecard. And what this does, it assesses pluripotency and uh, the differenti differentiation potential um, of the cells. So what you see right here, you have the BD6-4 with the mutation. Um, you have the corrected uh, cells right here. And then you have the same cells, I think, after uh, on day 10. And um, on the, this axis right here, you have self-renewal genes and then... Um, some other differentiation potential genes. Um, and then what you can see, or what at least what I saw, is that a lot of these genes, compared to mutation and the corrected one, they all have very similar expression levels of each. So like, for example, if you look at, let's say, this down here, um, most of them are, are in the blue or are down-regulated. 